Thank you, Marta. Thanks to all for inviting me to this very beautiful uh, meeting. Uh, the title of my talk is quite general. It is about uh, glycogen static adjustment. And actually, I will not discuss the whole uh, problem of glycogen isostasy, of course. I will focus mainly on some aspects of glycogen isostatic adjustment, which have some relationship with uh, PSMSL and uh, more in general with the uh, tight gauge observations. So I will, I will tell a few things about uh, uh, glycogen isostatic adjustment in general at the beginning. Then I will move to some hints about the physics of GIA and in particular to the so-called gravitational insert consistent modeling or sea level variations. Uh, point three will be about GIA and the secular sea level rise using uh, PSMSL observations uh, since uh, 1880 to present. At the end, I will say if I will find the time uh, something about uh, possible GIA accelerations during uh, the century time scale. So, the first point is about uh, some general, uh, uh, some general, general, general uh, statements uh, about uh, the importance of GIA, of GIA in, in this, in this um, uh, environment. This figure shows quite clearly the, import, the importance of GIA. This fingerprint is the fingerprint of the vertical um, rate of uplift at present time compared with the location of the uh, tight gauges of the permanent service of, for the mean sea level. Uh, as you can see, this fingerprint is uh, very large in some places, especially in areas which were previously called by ice during the last glacial maximum. And uh, in these areas, uh, you can find many of the tight gauge records with the longest, uh, the longest period of observation. So uh, this demonstrates the importance of GIA, in particular in these areas where the correction that we have to perform to the, uh, GIA, to the PSMSL observation is sometimes comparable with the expected value of the secular rate of sea level rise. So um, uh, I like a lot this figure, uh, which is basically saying that uh, uh, we do not believe that any land is completely stable. This figure shows some effect of GIA. For instance, this is a tight gauge record in Stockholm. You, you can see very clearly a, a, a almost constant rate of sea level fall in this, in this, in this case. But uh, there are also other phenomena affecting the tight gauge records, like, for instance, earthquakes in the case of uh, Negusake in Japan. Here, a sudden jump in the sea level record associated with some earthquake some time ago. Uh, you have also some uh, impact from human activities in Asia, in particular, in this case, study in Bangkok and in Manila. You see some regular trend of sea level rise until the end of the Second War. Then you see some acceleration, some abrupt change in the rate of sea level rise after, after this. And the last, the last slide is, the last plot is about Honolulu, in which you apparently see a normal rate of sea level rise on a secular time scale, which is quite close at the end to the rate uh, found in several studies uh, about the secular rate of sea level rise. But actually, it is volcano, so maybe there is some contribution for the uh, tectonics in this, in this kind of environment. So the main point here is that we should make corrections to the records in order to remove as much as possible all these contaminating effects, actually. What we can do for the moment is only to perform this correction, the correction for the, for the GIA. We don't have uh, the av available any model for performing global corrections of post-seismic deformation or global corrections for the possible effect, possible effect of human activities uh, at this, in, the same way, in the same way. So uh, that's uh, the face of the Earth and the last glacial maximum, uh, apparently the same as today, but it is not actually the same. Uh, you see huge ice masses in, in the northern hemisphere and also in the southern hemisphere. And uh, if you look carefully, you will see that uh, um, as a result of the last glaciation, uh, there was a bridge between Alaska and, uh, and um, uh, North America. There were bridges also in Asia, uh, between uh, Java and Borneo, between uh, uh, Australia and New Guinea, and so on. So the face of the Earth has been changing since then, and sea level has been changing uh, accordingly. And from what we know, uh, for instance, this is based uh, on a study of Kurt Lamek and others, from what we know uh, from the literature and from the field evidence is that sea level has not been changing everywhere in the same way. You see very different sea level curves in very different, in, in different parts of the world. You, you can see sea level, sea level rises at the almost uh, uniform rate at the beginning then at the changing rate. You see oscillations also. You see sea level falls, especially in the areas which were previously covered by the ice. And you see also some other complex uh, movements 
And what, what you see here is a result of glacial isostasy, but they, these observations also contain, of course, possible effects from tectonic movements and so on. So if you take a sort of average of all these uh, so-called uh, um, sea level um, zones or Clark zones, you get something that it is close to what you observe in uh, Barbados, for instance, in which you have a almost monotonous with some interruptions uh, associated to meltwater pulses of uh, sea level rise since the end of the, of the, of the uh, glaciation. So it is clear that we have different uh, patterns of sea level change in different parts of the world, but this map is global. If, if you look more carefully in narrow, in narrow environments like the Mediterranean, you will see different Clark zones even on such a small scale. Uh, for instance, along the coast of Africa, sea level was about at the same level as today, two kilo years before present. Probably we have observed a small ice stand in Tunisia. Sea level was about one meter, probably, at least according to this model, uh, below the present level along the coasts of, uh, of, uh, of, of Italy, and so on. So different behaviors which are due to uh, the quite complex physical ingredients that we put into the sea level equation when we discuss and solve for the GAA uh, signal. So some evidence from the Mediterranean showing different um, values of the uh, sea level rise during the last uh, uh, few kilo years. You have a present level at, at Haifa already 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. We have some sea level, sea level rise in Sicily. You have some significant sea level rise along the coast of Italy where you have fish tanks. You have different, different patterns of sea level change in Mallorca and so on. So uh, Clark zones even at, uh, at a very small spatial scale. So some physics about the GIA, uh, the main effect, the main physics is the so-called post-glacial rebound effect. You have huge ice mass at the last glacial maximum here, and this ice, this ice mass has been melting somewhat, so you have simultaneously some flow in the mantle, some uplift where the mass was located before, and some uh, subsidence where the so-called four bulges were located at the last glacial maximum. So this actually is the main effect that you can imagine. Uh, this effect strongly depends on the rheology of the Earth, which is represented by this dashboard here. It is less controlled by the elasticity of the Earth, which is a parameter which is uh, given by seismolo seismology, so it is well constrained. So actually this, this value, the viscosity of the mantle, is not at all well, well constrained, and at the same time the ice mass evolution is not well constrained. Actually, from the observations of post glacial rebound or GIA in general, we can guess the viscosity profile of the mantle and the chronology of the ice sheets. But this is only the main effect of uh, GIA. If you look more carefully to the equations, you can, you can try to establish a more general model for the uh, effects of GIA in which, uh, in which the, the uh, relative, sea level, uh, relative sea level change means the change in the thickness of this red bar here is depending simultaneously in changes of elevation of the sea surface relative to the Earth's center of mass and in changes of the elevation of the solid surface of the Earth, which means vertical displacement, always with respect to the Earth's center of mass. So in general, what we would like to have is an equation that gives uh, possibility of solving for this uh, sea level change here. And uh, from, the, from the theory, we see very clearly that this, this, this approach is ideally, ideally uh, designed to deal with the tight gauge problem. This is a, a tight gauge, something that is able to measure the sea surface relative to the solid surface of the Earth. So it is not simply a matter of post glacial rebound. Actually, we should account for different interaction between the uh, components of the, uh, of the system, which are the ice masses, the Earth, and the oceans. We have the direct effects coming from the interaction between the ice masses and the solid Earth. But we have also gravitational attraction between the ice masses and the oceans. And at the same time, when the oceans are changing their shape, they, they, they exert, exert a, 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 a complex load on the surface of the Earth, which deforms the Earth. And this cannot be, cannot be uh, neglected at all, especially if we look to the sea level variations in the far field of the former ice sheets. The, the, bottom, the bottom part is still more complex, if you want. When the Earth is changing its shape, uh, you, you have a change in the, in the inertia of the Earth, which means the degree 2 order 0 uh, gravity field of the Earth. This inertia variation will change the rotation of the Earth because of conservation of angular momentum, and these extra rotation effects will change the shape of the geoid, changing the ocean load and so on. 
So GIA is something more different, more, more complex than the simple interaction between the ice masses and the Earth. If you, if you come for all these interactions, you will see immediately that the, uh, the so-called eustatic solution of the sea level, sea level equation, which is this equation here, which means uh, sea level change is uniform and the same everywhere, is not holding at all. And this, the theoretical background we, uh, that explains the existence of different Clark zones. So I can, I can skip this, probably, because um, it is somewhat complicated. But the, the philosophical point here, if you want, is the sea level equation is in, 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 the, in the complete form. The philosophical point here is that uh, uh, we have an integral equation in which a sea level change is in, in, at the left-hand side, but it is, it is also embedded in some uh, convolution integrals in the right-hand side. It means that in order to have the sea level at present time, sea level, relative sea level change at present time, we should know the time evolution of sea level at all previous times and everywhere on the surface of the Earth. Of course, we need information also for the uh, changing, uh, from the changing volume of the, of the ice sheets. And uh, these four terms here, one, two, three, and four, are giving the um, complex uh, uh, pattern of sea level variations that we have seen experimentally uh, using the sea level proxies. Uh, a few slides ago. So, well, the rheology of the Earth is coming into the problem through the green function here. The green function is something that represents the response of the Earth to a simple localized load. The green function will depend on mental viscosity, so at the end, the sea level change will be a function of ice and of the response of the Earth. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, um, uh, the viscosity of the Earth and the spatial distribution is uh, not uh, fully constrained constraint before solving this equation for the past sea level variations, actually from the observations of sea level variations as here, we should be able to put constraints on the lateral extent of the ice uh, aggregates on the, on, the, on, the, on the viscosity variations at depth and so on. So it is nice to observe that the sea level equation as, as unknown, what, what we observe now at tight gauges basically, when we have solved for the sea level change S, or for the history of sea level change S, we can retrieve information also on vertical displacement and on the uh, variations of the gravity field. But the first thing that we do when we solve this equation is that we consider the effect that we would observe uh, at the tight gauges, which are therefore very, very important for us. So the, the, the main question is, is this equation able to explain some observations? And uh, uh, yes, it is, uh, as you know from the literature, in, in the top left frame, you see the observations from uh, uh, Tashing and Peltier, this uh, so-called database of Tashing and Peltier 1991. Actually, it is a collection of data. It is not exactly a database. But the observations are here in, in this scatter plot. We run our models, and we make predictions in the same places where we have information about past levels. The two clouds are really quite consistent, so we are very happy that we can find the viscosity profile that globally is able to fit together with some description of the ice chronology of the Earth uh, to fit the observed relative sea level variations. This does not imply that we uh, locally have a very good fit everywhere, of course. There is a global comparison between data and, and, data and uh, uh, predictions. So you can do it if you want now. We have built a code for solving the sea level equation, which is uh, completely accessible to the, to the community. Um, the code is really very simple. Uh, it has um, the, the main target of solving the sea level equation, but it can also be used to make a comparison of predictions uh, at the tide gauges uh, and, also to, um, and also predictions um, at the GPS stations, for instance. It can also be used for computing the changing shape of the Earth, means the so-called Stokes coefficients of the Earth in response to, in response to GIA. So now I, I, go to, I go to the point about the GIA and secular sea level rise uh, um, using PSMSL data. Uh, uh, this is a table taken from a paper we have written recently with Gaia, uh, Galassi. Uh, this is a table that collects all the previous estimates of the secular sea level rise published since the first work of Gutenberg in 1941. Uh, the table is quite complex. We have the authors of the paper, we have the values of the secular sea level rise, we have the period during which the tide gauge records have been considered, and we have some, some, some information about the methods you used to, 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 to make this assessment. And in the last column, you have uh, uh, information about the GIA correction. 
And as you can see from this table, GIA correction started only in, 19, uh, uh, in 1989 with Peltier and Tushingham. Before this, no GIA correction was, was applied at all. And uh, starting from this period, a, a lot of corrections have been proposed in the literature which have had a, 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 a significant impact on our law, on knowledge about the secular sea level variations. Uh, another way to look to the table is to, to plot all the values considered in the same table. Uh, it is funny to observe that uh, only five to six assessments are, are available since uh, 1970, and then with increasing awareness of global warming and probably also quality of the GIA correction that uh, we should apply in order to have reliable observations of uh, secular sea level rise, you had a lot of determinations of this uh, parameter, which is roughly about 1.5 millimeters per year during a one century, let's say. And, but the scatter is quite large indeed. The scatter is large and uh, consider also that the error bars in this plot are, are not uh, have not the same significance. Some of them are root mean square, some others are standard deviations of the mean. So there is some confusion about the, 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 the meaning of the error that we should attach to these uh, secular sea level uh, variations assessments. Uh, a very important paper was Douglas in 1997. In this paper, Douglas has not used the whole set of PSMSR observations in order to estimate the secular sea level rise. He has used a very, a, very narrow, um, a, a very narrow set of observations. I will show it uh, in, a, in a while. Um, but for the first time, it has been stressed a little bit the importance of the uh, GIA correction, in particular this value of 1.8 millimeters per year plus minus 0.1, and 0.1, 0.1 here is the standard deviation of the mean, is uh, the value obtained correcting the GIA as DPS MSL trends by the effects of the I3G model of glacial isostasy, which is a model developed by Tashin and Appleton in 1992 93. So, only after some selection, we can guess the value of secular sea level rise, adding also some correction uh, for post glacial rebound effects or GIA effects, if you want. So, the selection is really very important. We have the figure on the top more shows the, uh, all, all, all the PSMSR records available uh, from the rec revised rec record length uh, set, and the bottom frame shows the uh, very limited uh, set employed by Douglas, 97, 23 tide gauges, which have a quite global coverage, let's say. Uh, but the difference in the numbers of these two um, samples is really, is really amazing. Uh, so the, the point that uh, the philosophy was that only a few tight gauges are admissible in order to uh, assess, assess the uh, uh, secular rate because some of them are too short, so we need at least six years' uh, um, records. Uh, some of them should not be used because they are coming from sites close to collision at tectonic plate boundaries. Some of, that, some of them are not enough complete, so we need a completeness which is 80% or better. They should be in reasonable agreement at low frequencies with records from nearby gauges, so some kind of qualitative statement <coughs> saying, that, saying that there should be some consistency between uh, nearby, nearby tight gauges, and not, that's important for us, not from areas deeply covered by ice during the last glacial maximum, and uh, strengthen it in Douglas 97 to eliminate also records from sites in the area immediately adjacent to the peripheral bulge. So, um, this, uh, Five statements, statements are quite qualitative, uh, of course, in some respect, but using them, it is possible to arrive to a reasonable estimate for the secular sea level rise. So the point is that uh, only one model was used by Douglas, and actually today we have several models available. We have I I3G, actually, the same model which has been used by Douglas and by others before him, but we have also I5G now, and the model developed by Kurt Lambert and co-workers in Australia. So which one is best? Uh, I, I don't think that we can make this selection a priori. Uh, there are different realizations of the uh, combination between uh, the Earth viscosity and the distribution of the surface ice sheets at the last glacial maximum, which are best fitting different sets of relative sea level observations during the Holocene. So probably the truth is in the middle. The point that it is important uh, to make for us here is that uh, although globally they are following the same eustatic sea level curve, with some differences, of course, for the three models, 
from, uh, from a regional point of view, uh, for instance, if, if you compare the two Laurent tides in IS5G and, uh, and uh, IS3G, for instance, and uh, ANU05, we get, we, we show, we show, we, we, we arrive at large differences in the equivalency level curve. So these models are not agreeing on a regional scale, huge regions, I would like to say. And uh, even in Antarctica, if you look carefully at this plot, we have different scenarios for the melting of the, of the Antarctic ice sheet. So uh, using these models, we will get, of course, different corrections to the tide gauge observations, which will provide, at the end, different averages, so different secularcy level rise values, uh, according to the, to the model that we are using. Um, and of course, if we use different assumptions to describe the ice sheets and the earth rheology, we get different fingerprints for the for the relative sea level rise, that what we observe at the tide gauges according to the three models I've shown before, plus ice one, note that ice one has no uh, mass variations across Antarctica. These three fingerprints are quite similar, but are not the same, the same fingerprint at all. And if I correct the tide gauges according to these three fingerprints, uh, I will get different values for the secular sea level rise. So the idea is now, okay, uh, which model should we use? The idea is that, uh, uh, GIA model predictions at tight gauges should be m the same for all models. So the idea here was, uh, in, in a recent paper, was to select from the whole set of revised local reference observations only those tight gauges for which the predictions are the same for the three models within a certain error bar. So we end up with a set of 45 tight gauges, black plus white in this plot, and we clean up the set according to the same criteria of Douglas 1997, and we end up with the number of tight gauges with black ones, which is comparable to the number of D97, but for which we are sure that the GIA correction is model independent. And um, if you do this, uh, we are back to the, to, the, to, the, to, the same, to the same figure I already shown at the beginning. If you do this, we get the value of secular sea level rise of 1.5 plus 1, 0.1 millimeters per year, which is roughly cutting this uh, distribution of assessments obtained before us in, in the middle. So it means a good sense wins at the end. The, the good model is not determined at all. What we have imposed is the constraint that the GIA correction should be the same uh, for the tight gauges that we consider. So that's uh, um, how GIA is entering into play in this context in a very important way, I think, because uh, if you notice, the black dots are GIA corrected here, I have GIA corrected, the white dots here are not. So if you correct by GIA, you tend to obtain values which are in excess to those you obtain if you don't make any correction. That makes sense, of course. So something new about GIA. Can we say something new about GIA? I have made a simple exercise a few days ago. Um, I've taken uh, this sea uh, level fingerprint, this for GIA ICE5G EM2, means the classical ICE5G model by Peltier. That's the rate of sea level change expected globally at present time, uh, and the dots here are the tight gauges as usual. What happens if I take the time derivative of this, of this map here? I get this. This is not zero. I mean, the point here is that together with a secular sea level rise due to GIA, we have also a small sea level acceleration due to GIA. And the amplitude of this sea level acceleration is very strongly anti-correlated to the amplitude of the change of sea level. And that's basic physics. It can be analytically demonstrated using the Turcotte, uh, the, the, the old Haskell model that you find in the classical textbook of geodynamics. The maximum value of acceleration is found here in the, in the atom. Actually, it is found in the, in the, in the in the bulk of Antarctic, but uh, we have a lot of tight gauges here, for instance, and here we have also a, a, a peak uh, acceleration due to GIA. So uh, this, this ICE5G model predicts that in the, in the Baltic area there should be an extra acceleration due to GIA, probably visible if uh, we go to the tight gauge observations and try to make some assessment like we have done here. The blue uh, histogram is the um, is the sea level acceleration obtained from, the, uh, from a very simple parabolic uh, interpolation of the, of the records from the, from the Baltic Sea, the records from the PSMSL, and the red histogram here is the acceleration that we obtain using a global set of uh, tight gauges, uh, something similar to what 
to what Douglas did uh, in uh, 1997. The difference in the average accelerations in the two histogram is of the order of magnitude of 0.02 uh, millimeters per year per century, which is basically what you expect by the model. We are close to 0.2 millimeter, millimeter per year per century. So I would say that we have probably an evidence of the existence of the VIE acceleration in the Baltic Sea by a very simple argument based on the on the fingerprints and the observations of uh, PSMSL, uh, PSMSL C-level variations. Thank you.